We have discussed a few questions that we thought would be really interesting to uh, cover today, and I wanted to make sure I got them right, so I took my very special WSO2 notebook and have uh, put them down here. So um, one of the things that we thought we would do is to start by, by providing an overview of what we really mean when we talk about WSO2 as a platform. Uh, and then um, also uh, with our panelists talking about what is the business or technology objective that you are addressing um, using uh, WSO2 software. Um, and so with that, uh, what I thought I would do to provide sort of a general overview is to start with Samasa. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, WSO2 has, if you go to the website, obviously we'll see about um, 25 plus products. And so many people ask, why are we doing so many products kind of scenario? The key reason why we are doing, uh, implementing so many is that uh, we are not Im Im implementing a number of products, rather we are implementing a platform for our users to use it in a real enterprise sense. So the rationale is that all these products falls into various elements of a platform that the enterprises need uh, in order to realize their enterprise uh, middleware architecture. So there are various elements such as uh, you have the problem of application development, you have the problem of uh, connecting systems and integrating, and then you have to worry about the uh, presenting uh, the things to the user, so IT consumers has to be taken care of, and then you have to think about uh, with the upcoming trends, the mobile space and IoT space, uh, so those elements are required in order to address the holistic picture. And then also you have to worry about the cross-cutting aspects such as um, analytics, security, governance, and then make sure that when you are doing and using these uh, platform elements, they are uh, seamlessly integrated with each other so that you can realize uh, the platform uh, the way you want and uh, build and uh, mix and match the components and get the job done. The other important thing that I would like to um, highlight here is that uh, the, that's the external perspective of the WSO2 platform. That's what the users see when they are using the elements of the platform. Uh, so, and uh, the platform is not a platform only from outside. It is also a platform from inside. And that is why the carbon architecture is important. And uh, what is the importance of uh, the platform being a platform internally? Uh, the key advantage is that it is future-proof. Given that we have a proven platform within WSO2 as a single code-based product, uh, if uh, new innovations come, new trends come, we can very easily move fast and introduce those components into the platform so that our users can benefit from the integrated platform as users at the top layer. Great. Um, and next, I'd like to, uh, Henrik, hear a little bit about you and what you've been doing at E.ON to support uh, your efforts at the energy company. And so if you talk, can you hear me? Yeah. So if you talk about E.ON, it's a utilities company, and uh, you could do a lot of things. I mean, utilities is very much from generation to distribution to sales. And what we've been focused on was our sales processes, I mean, if you look into the past of utilities companies, we, we did not really have customers, we more had points of delivery. And of course there was a person behind it, but it was more the point of delivery. And uh, since some time we are going to focus more on the customer and, and get more in touch with the customer, more than the typical one time a year when you do their meter read and send the meter read to your company. So we, we were going to be in regular contact with our customer. And uh, we did something like two, three years ago, we did a we did an assessment if we have gaps in our integration solutions and identified that we have exactly this gap in providing our information to the outside world and, and providing content to different, to different channels. So uh, we've decided for WSO2 as a platform, as an additional integration platform in E.ON. But if we now talk on, on, on platform, what do we, do we mean with a platform? It's more than this technology platform. It's more than carbon. So if we talk about platform, it is also how we are using it at Aeon. So putting the governance around it, putting an organization around it, and define the processes, how different projects are making use of the solution. And, and for this, we put, we put quite some effort in it in, in setting up monthly architecture board meetings to make sure that 
solutions built on top of the platform are built consistent and we can exchange and enhance specific solution components. And um, uh, Ashok, uh, you have been working with a number of startups to help them foster their innovation. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, my experience uh, mostly been in the product innovation space uh, for the tech startups, but also in the enterprise. I actually spent uh, about 10 years in the US and almost 10 years now in UK. Uh, and I was able to see about 100 plus tech startups in the US evolving all the way from st starting from the beginning to big companies like Siemens and EMC innovating and we helped them with uh, product innovation. Uh, the big challenge we saw at that time is if you're building a new product, I'm, I'm sure it applies to enterprises too, how do you build various components? Do you go and buy very expensive licensed products from Oracle, IBM, or if you want a reporting engine, you go and buy it from third party, and that costs millions and millions of dollars. Uh, I'll just give one example. Uh, we uh, were the pioneers to put uh, your credit card statements online uh, back in 97 uh, for a, a startup called Edox, uh, which got acquired for $180 million. But that took nine months from the concept to getting a working product and another six months to stabilize. I think now we're in a different, we live in a different time. Uh, we don't have the luxury of time. We need to move products a lot faster. Uh, and I think there are three elements uh, from an innovation perspective where WSU really comes into picture. One like um, Nigel mentioned yesterday, customer experience is crucial, whether it's an enterprise or whether it's a product we are building it needs to connect to various excellent customer experience, but that's changing too. Two, it needs to integrate. You can't just build a point solution. It needs to integrate today to systems. It needs to integrate to a lot of systems in the future. And three, it has to be scalable and security. What we are finding is, as Samisa said, uh, because WSO2 is bringing so many core components together as a platform, we can help entrepreneurs innovate and build platform on top of platform. So we are building healthcare platforms, we are building uh, IoT-based uh, analytical platform, uh, and so on, and it's powered by WSO2. Uh, and just to give us uh, an example now, um, back in early January, we helped a company called Modern Democracy to come up with a digital platform for election management. From concept to MVP, six weeks, three sprints, we got the product up and running. We ran two pilot polling stations, and then in March it ran on 22 polling stations in UK. And then on May 5th, I know some of you would have voted for mayor's election and local election. That platform ran on 600 polling stations, full digital, complete automation, and it'll be used for the referendum on the 23rd. So within six months, we're able to not only innovate, build a product, take to market, and scale, and we didn't have to do a lot of the components uh, that WC to provide it. So that's the beauty. Thanks. And uh, Gabriel, you, you work with a number of clients, but most notably you've done some really interesting uh, platform work with governments. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, uh, I had the opportunity to use uh, 11 WSO2 products uh, as a platform for uh, Moldovan government. And uh, from this point of view of uh, WSO2 as a platform, actually their interoperability platform being one of the latest in, um, implemented in Europe, they had a chance to uh, actually uh, use the entire stack of WSO2 for their uh, uh, digital service, public digital services agenda implementation. So um, somehow um, I, I was from the, from the very beginning in the position to implement the, those products together. And uh, I was very happy to, to implement WSO2 because uh, their products use the same uh, architecture, the same carbon framework, and they are seamlessly integrated together. Great. So one of the topics that we thought would be good to cover is the fact that today um, many applications have to support a range of channels, 
and that's from your web and mobile apps to SaaS and even the Internet of Things. So what we thought we wanted to discuss was what are the challenges and opportunities um, that uh, you guys have experienced and how has a platform approach uh, contributed to addressing them? And uh, Ashok, maybe you could start us? Sure, thank you. Um, I think it's given, uh, I'm sure most of you are building applications, you have to consider multi-channel. Uh, you can't do point-to-point -point anymore. The challenge is how do we design it, but how do we build it incrementally and, and facilitate it? What we are seeing is um, when we are building a, a new product or an enterprise application, we are working with some of the partners here, you have to design it such that it can probably start with one or two channels, but it needs to be flexible to accommodate other channels that are down the stream. Uh, with the API manager and the capabilities that WSO2 has, you can expose the capabilities target one or two channels that you need to start to go live with, but then also design for subsequent channels. Um, going back to the election management platform example I mentioned, when we built the first version of the product, we only built one iPad or, or a tablet interface for the polling station managers to use. Then subsequently, we have to introduce an interface for the council executives, uh, for the regional people to look at the data at the real time and bring the information through for people who go for canvassing for election. So multiple channels started coming and it all happened within a period of six months. So if you don't design your platform day one for that, it is a big challenge uh, and I think that's inevitable. And uh, Gabriel, I think you have some good examples of that as well. Yeah, actually, um, uh, my example is my customer example. So they had uh, somehow to implement uh, uh, a lot of features for uh, the citizens because uh, citizen uh, is using mobile applications, is using uh, uh, internet to, um, I don't know, pay facilities, etc., provided by government service, government services. So, um, uh, because of that, uh, we uh, had to uh, somehow use the API power of WSO2 platform to, uh, to uh, give the uh, software developers a lot of uh, options when implementing such uh, digital services. Great. And Hendrik, uh, you've had some experience with that as well. Uh, yeah. So when we're looking at our platform, we are using WSO2 ESB and API Manager. So these are the two only components we are utilizing right now. And uh, um, our, our problem is not that much that we need to build the business logic. Business logic is existing in E.ON. We have a number of business applications that are hosting this business logic. In the past, when we added channels to uh, customer channels or other channels directly to these business logic, it, it was costful because everybody had to take care on its own for this. And second, this could cause inconsistencies because everybody put his own logic. So you could not be sure that the information provided on all channels has been consistent to customers. So meaning customer looking in his mobile app might see a different information than a customer looking into his web application. So our main point was bring this information in a consistent way to an API layer and then have every channel accessing this API layer, which is which which has caused some effort for the first channel. And, and, and we actually got the feedback, why didn't you choose an easier solution, a direct solution? So it, it, it was some overhead we were creating. Uh, but, but having this implemented for the first channel, this was reusable for the other channels. So in the meantime, we have, uh, if, if you would go to uh, eon.de, you would see the same information as would if you would go to your customer self-care, to a mobile app, to a customer experience platform, all of them are making use of the same APIs, of 80% of the same APIs. Of course, there's always some effort in, in adding new functionality, but now we, we've learned the hard way and we gathered the experience and bringing this to the API layer. Um, so we, we are adding business objects. So, so a new channel might add a new requirement like forecast. And if forecast was not existing, of course, it's a new API. But then this API is also, also available for the already existing channels and can be built upon. And um, 
the second thing is also this happens. Different channels might have different requirements to the granularity of the API. So, so an API which is complex but, but capable or good fitting to a website might not have the right granularity for a mobile application. So also there we have to sort of mingle around and this requires this process that we have establishing that we're not just creating version 1.1 of the same API or version 1.2, but have a controlled approach on at what point in time are we adding a new API and when are we still use, making use of the same API. Yeah. Um, so the other thing we were looking at is the fact that, and, and you probably have all experienced this, um, products will, or a project will start seemingly with a simple objective, uh, whether it's um, providing a managed API um, to um, customers or partners, or whether it's data sharing with your supply chain. Um, but very quickly, you realize that um, there's a lot of um, technology underlying that. It's like that initial goal is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so with that, you've got multiple technologies coming into play. And so with that in mind, what are some of the advantages of, of taking a platform approach to support that? Um, Gabriel? Yeah, this uh, is very simple from uh, WSO2 perspective, <laughs> actually, because uh, WSO2 is one of the few technology provider who uh, are implementing standards. So either we are talking about SAML or uh, uh, SOAP or um, uh, I don't know, some industry standards, a WSO2 in enterprise integration pattern, WSO2 implemented and uh, tried somehow to respect this. Uh, so inside an organization or um, as in my case for the government, if they have legacy applications or uh, different software who are still um, using standards, the integration uh, is uh, very uh, straightforward, actually. So uh, my experience, uh, from my experience, I didn't have any uh, failed story of uh, using WSO2 inside an organization uh, uh, along with uh, other technologies. Great. And um, Henrik? Uh, so you are the lucky guy because you have a greenfield approach and we are more the unlucky guys because <laughs> we have already things existing and this is, this is some of the effort because yes, security architecture is a very important point and I mean, we have an existing security architecture which is a bit outdated in some areas because we are only supporting, or this architecture is only supporting uh, security standards like SAML and do not know about OAuth which is a pity because WSO2 IP manager is talking OAuth, so we have to mingle around with our existing identity provider to make this working. We had to mingle around with a connection to the backend systems to enable the logic to the outside world, which is not only a technical mingling around, because somehow you always get to this data, which is also a mingling around from a business process, because sometimes the data in the backend system is not that, that that form that you could use it in the process. So changing from a manual process, customer calling a call center, talking to a call center guy, agreeing on something, updated the next day in the backend system is not the same as having a self-service and the self-service is expecting not to be updated the next day, but the next second. So these, these are the things we had to work around. And uh, the good thing was we could the good, thing. the good thing was we could focus on all these things left and right because we knew we had this platform in the middle that is supporting the actual integration and we can take care of then of the backend logic and security architecture. Um, and Ashok, would you like to just share? I think you boys are the lucky guys. I have the difficult job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have to look at this um, from two, di two different perspectives. One, from a customer perspective, whether it's an enterprise or a, or a tech company, uh, what is their requirement and are they able to articulate the requirement for the short term or the long term? That's a big challenge for those of us in the services sector. Uh, the other side is the technology, which you have to design it, even though you've got the WSO2 capabilities, you have to design it so that it can scale with growing demand, and business demand always grows. It never stays static. Um, 
we find that uh, using agile approach really works. So if um, I'm, again, focusing from a business perspective, if you can take a, an incremental approach and an agile approach, and if you focus on two weekly deliverables on your functionality and you keep on integrating, you can support lots and lots of capabilities over time. Uh, that seemed to work very well. But I think it's very crucial to understand what customer wants, what the technology can provide, and channel that such that it can scale over time. Thanks. And that's actually a great setup for the next question, which is, um, what are the considerations um, when you are incrementally implementing a platform uh, across uh, different customers or regionally? Um, what are the lessons that you've learned along the way? Um, and maybe, uh, Henrik, you could start us? Um, I think there's always this conflict between getting things out fast and, and thinking them through to the end. So um, from a platform perspective, we of course would have preferred to think this platform through. And again, not only from technology perspective, but from a process and, and, and organizational perspective. But then it would have taken some time before the first projects could have used it. So we, 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 we have been in constant exchange between the platform team and the projects team to make sure that these projects are working on this platform, can, can start on this platform. However, always knowing that some things might change over time because we're just gathering more experience and we, we are scaling up the platform. So it's this, uh, this uh, as, as I said before, this organizational aspect is, is very important, making sure that, uh, that, that platform work and project work keeps being in line and uh, the other aspect also that I mentioned before is making sure that this platform is fitting into the overall application landscape of an organization. So also in projects, sooner or later, there comes a point where a specific need cannot be fulfilled by this platform nor by other applications that are already existing. And then also there we need to have a consistent, we want to have a consistent approach and not just installing the next component that might solve the problem. So the classic approach that we, I think, took 10, 15 years ago. Uh, we had a product, uh, we had a problem, so we chosen for a product. It's more a, we have a product, we have to find a solution which might consist out of different products. And, and this was the other aspect of the platform work we had to do. Start, starting small, fulfilling the need, but then having been in constant exchange with the different projects to make sure that this is growing in parallel to the project requirements. And uh, Gabriel, can you talk a little bit about your experiences? Yeah, the, the only experience where um, <laughs> WSO2 platform was uh, uh, implemented uh, from the very beginning was that from uh, Moldovan government. But the other cases, usually, because not everyone has a chance to be a startup, <laughs> to start it <laughs> with WSO2 from the very beginning. So uh, the other experience is that uh, WSO2 is to be adopted inside an organization. So usually it starts incrementally, as you said. Uh, you have to convince and you have to build trust of the technology. Um, you have to uh, take it slowly because customers, uh, at least mine, are not um, uh, open source lovers in the very beginning. Uh, I just uh, want to share an experience I had uh, just two weeks ago when someone uh, explained me that open source is like a community, uh, I don't know, hidden developers uh, who are trying to implement the software. So nobody, I mean, there are people who don't understand actually the open source uh, community. So uh, yeah, actually uh, you start with a product, uh, you build trust, after one year, you discuss uh, adopting another product. Many organizations need at least one WSO2 product, uh, maybe two or three um, as usual. So yeah, this is uh, my way of uh, implementing it. Okay. And uh, Ashok, what are you saying? Yeah, I think uh, I can see two elements here, one from a Again, from an internal customer perspective, how do you identify your requirements for the short term and long term, and how, how do you plan for it? Um, in a traditionally, like your, Enric was saying, it, it, it took quite a lot of time. I was consulting for Network Rail about 
five, six years ago, and we were working on a uh, content management strategy. It took six months to get the funding raised and another six months to identify the requirements. Then we brought in Microsoft to advise us how to do it, and it took another 18 months to get the version one of SharePoint up and running. So <laughs> uh, that's, that's enterprise, right? Your, your challenges. Uh, Again, coming back to WSO2 as a platform, because it provides a lot of capability out of the box and it's open source, it helps us, one, to roll out faster uh, with an incremental plan, and two, funding-wise, it saves a lot. It's open source. Um, currently working, with, um, working on a couple of projects through partners. Uh, one is uh, with V, we are doing a project for a very large water department called Water Plus. And the customer, together with the partner and us, we agreed for nine two-week sprints. And the beauty is they can see something running every two weeks on top of WSO2 because it, it allows us to do that. And it, in the nine sprints, they'll see the product up and running. But it doesn't stop there because that system is basically integrating two very large water departments in UK. It'll produce a lot of data. And I'm sure on your enterprises, you are sitting with a lot of data. How do you expose that data through API to other systems? How do you integrate them? How do you utilize them? Maybe you can uh, do uh, predictive analysis using DAS to drive additional business revenue for your corporates. So I think it's, it's, we have to think a project incrementally. It's long term. You obviously can get funding only for a particular phase of the project and you have to design it and implement it, but plan for the long term, that, that's what I would advise. And I think WSO2 platform can help you to incrementally roll out these functionalities. And Samasa, of course, you bring the experience of working with multiple customers. Yeah, so um, I think uh, it is pretty obvious that um, uh, the need for iteration is inevitable, uh, you have to have the capacity. What we are experiencing is that uh, different users, different customers, different enterprises are at different layers and different uh, levels of need when it comes to uh, the iterative approach. Uh, if you are starting Greenfield, uh, you have the luxury of defining what your uh, iterative approach is and obviously you will start with your service implementation, integration, and then later think about how to um, visualize this, analyze this, and obviously from day one you can start thinking about governance and security and then gradually enhance those uh, security architectures, etc. But at the same time, if you already have a well-defined uh, integration uh, infrastructure uh, and you don't have plans to um, uh, replace it uh, in the uh, near future, still WS2 can come and help you because you might have the need to take these um, systems to your end users, you might want your business users to uh, use them in an easier manner rather than you or the IT department having to do all the work for you um, and then um, uh, build systems so that the businesses can easily come and uh, um, tell you what they need and get um, self-service done. Uh, so if you look at the analytics component, uh, then uh, con uh, consumer components such as dashboards, etc. All these things can be used in heterogeneous environments and brought in and built to uh, be integrated into the existing uh, infrastructure. And you can view it as an iterative approach to expand from where you are to go to the next level. So uh, whichever the project may be, whichever the enterprise may be, whichever the need may be, given the platform nature of it and given the uh, the, the possibility to go iterative, you always have an opportunity to use WSLOOP platform at any phase of your organization or project. Um, the other thing that we were looking at um, is that uh, when we look about uh, deployment, uh, a lot of organizations out there are thinking, you know, do I run this on premise? And, you know, whether it's on your servers or in a private cloud, or do I go to something like a managed cloud or even off to a SaaS offering? So, um, with that in mind, um, I was curious to hear from our panelists 
what decisions have you made for your own impl implementations, and what were the factors that led to those decisions? Um, so, Henrik, would you want to start us off? Um, we, we actually did not take these decisions. I mean, our focus so far was um, enabling the existing world. So, existing, existing capabilities around power and gas, which are historically on-premise. So, it was making on-premise data available for different, different channels. So, based on this, to, to get to the existing systems, we, of course, also had to put our WSO2 platform on-premise. We are now looking into new products and services, so no longer power and gas, but uh, let's call them energy-related services, which could be PV, could be battery, could be heating, could be uh, home automation, other things. We, we still have to figure out is the, if this is something what we're going to do locally. I mean, EON is present in a lot of different regions in, in Europe, or if we are sharing solutions across different regions. However, whatever we decide for, if it's regional or if it's uh, shared across a company, um, these are new capabilities and these new capabilities will probably not be part of the existing application landscape, so just setting up uh, these applications in a cloud. And, and, and we've made some experiences um, cloud-based and based on this, we will also look into how we make sure that looking from the existing installations that we have, API management and ESB, how, how we are integrating then these cloud-based solutions. And uh, terminology we're discussing right now is a hybrid, hybrid approach where some of the components are on-premise, some of the components are in the cloud, and we still have to figure out what is the solution. And uh, as, as we heard yesterday in the keynote, probably we're getting into the discussion and probably the, the competitors of WSO2 in the cloud are more the Microsofts and, and Amazons of this world that are bringing part of the capability as part of their platform. So we see the advantages of having the same products on cloud, on, on, in, in cloud and on-premise, but we still have to conclude what is, the, what is the future approach that we're going to take. And uh, Samasa, would you like to share yeah. some thoughts? So I think uh, uh, the deployment options are a real uh, question that you have to address when you're talking about a platform. And uh, uh, our approach when it comes to designing our products is to make sure that uh, we provide the capability to have a seamless approach when it comes to making decisions. And you don't have to worry about the migrations, et cetera, uh, when it comes to designing, okay, today I want to be on-premise, or today I want to be on the cloud, maybe tomorrow I want to be on-premise. Uh, when I want to move, can I move easily, uh, et cetera. So uh, to address those questions, our approach in our platform is to help users uh, develop applications without being worrying about where they are going to deploy. And we will take care of uh, that particular deployment problem from the platform perspective, and all the platform can be uh, deployed in whichever option that you want. And um, Ashok. Um. In our experience, we are primarily seeing more cloud-based uh, deployment, but also some hybrid as well. Uh, on the product entrepreneur side, it's easy to design for cloud, make it available for consumers and corporate. But they design it such that it can be hybrid if you were to sell into an enterprise, because corporates have different security policies. So you've got to accept that. Uh, that's what we are seeing on the, on the product uh, entrepreneur side. On the enterprise, it's more hybrid. So for example, we are part of the uh, WSO2.telco uh, offering. Uh, I think Venera is the next speaker after this. And that was designed to be cloud, but then there are customers uh, in the telco services wanted to be on-premise as well. So it has to be designed both ways, but it's mostly um, Cloud is what we are looking at, uh, and, and we are talking to WSO2 about using the WSO2's own cloud to host some of these applications as well. Okay. And Gabriel? Yeah, my uh, only experience with um, a cloud was the government cloud, not because I didn't want it to <laughs> install it and uh, use it in, uh, in the cloud, but because in Eastern Europe still the customers are um, skeptical about uh, cloud and using cloud. So basically they are using uh, on-premises installations. But uh, regarding the cloud, um, there are some requirements for any technology running in the cloud. 
uh, in terms of performance and um, uh, some uh, tricks. And um, we had some uh, requirements from the Moldovan government to, um, to be um, um, somehow confirmed with, uh, with uh, this uh, cloud uh, tuning. And um, WC2 platform was ready to run on the cloud. So um, we didn't have any, any problem with that. Well, um, it looks like we've got a few minutes left to take a couple questions. So we thought we would turn it to you in the audience and see if there are any, yet any questions for our panelists. Is there anyone out there? All right. Well, then I think we will we're, we will end it on a lightning round, and just uh, turn it to each of you to say if there was one important thing to take away from the discussion today. What would it be, Ashok? That's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say the concept of platform understanding what is that concept and how various WSO2 components are tightly integrated, uh, as, uh, as Sanjeeva said at the keynote's speech, and the fact that uh, analytical capabilities are being bundled into that, I think I see a great advantage. Uh, at the end of the day, once you deploy this platform and the capabilities, analytical analyticals capabilities are very, very crucial for all of us, right? That's really what we look for at the end of the day. So I think platform seems to be the key word for me. And Henrik? I think platform is always an iterative approach. It's, you, you do not just deploy a full platform. You start with some things that provide the first value, and then you're extending your platform over time based on requirements. And, and you are aware that you're never done. It will ever. <laughs> there will always new releases. There will always new requirements. And Gabriel? Yeah, I see some important points in the use, uh, having uh, um, uh, unity. I mean, uh, some the similar way of configuration, and uh, I see uh, an importance of WSO2 as a platform. Uh, I see an importance in uh, having this um, uh, identity governance, some services uh, based uh, constructed in every product. And Samasa. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, the key here is to, if you are looking for a platform, you have to look for the completeness of the platform. And then uh, it could be complete today, but then is it future proof? Uh, can you have trust that uh, you will survive with this platform in the future? And then what are your options when it comes to deployment, etc.? Do you have flexibility? Those things need to be taken into account when you evaluate the platform and make a choice. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I think we've done the amazing thing and, and ended on time. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank all of our terrific panelists today, and uh, we have a great keynote coming up in just a moment.